Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders webinar on Beyond 1%, how digitalisation can help Australia punch above its weight in the global race to net zero. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Alicia Prince. I'm a Chartered Engineer and General Manager of Victoria at Engineers Australia. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Siemens. Siemens is a global technology powerhouse that started its Australian operations over 150 years ago. Active around the world, the company brings together the digital and physical worlds to benefit customers and society and focuses on the areas of industry, infrastructure, mobility and healthcare. I'm now pleased to introduce our guest speakers this afternoon. Axel Lorenz is the global CEO of process automation at Siemens. He started his professional career as an electrical engineer for project planning and commissioning, and today leads a business that provides end-to-end -end automation solutions for industries as diverse as food and beverage, chemical and mineral processing, pharmaceuticals and water. His focus on helping customers leverage digital transformation and bridging the gap between innovation and sustainability. Dr. Vicky Au is the APAC Director of Decarbonisation at consulting and engineering company Wood. Vicky has nearly 20 years of experience in the innovation ecosystem and was previously Deputy Lead of the CSIRO's Hydrogen Industry Mission, which she co-developed and launched. Walter Mailer is CEO and co-founder of Melbourne company Automation Innovation delivering precision engineering and automated solutions across a wide range of manufacturing sectors. Recently, the company has used artificial intelligence and robotic automation to solve a problem faced by the glass bottling industry. Their innovative laser cleaning system accelerates the process of cleaning glass moulds, eliminating harsh chemicals and reducing the use of raw materials. Finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Keith Ritchie. Keith is the Head of Communications and Government Affairs for Siemens in Australia and has been instrumental in driving thought leadership in the country in areas such as green hydrogen, digitalisation and Industry 4.0. Please welcome Axel, Vicky, Walter and Keith. Thanks Alicia for that great introduction. Um, I feel very honoured to be here with such a um, high profile privileged panel. Um, We've got locals and we've got a, a, a very important international guest uh, with us in Australia from Germany with Axel. Um, and also to have so many uh, of Australia's and, and even some international engineers dialed into this webinar is fantastic. It shows that there's a great interest in what Australia can do when it comes to um, punching above our weight when it comes to sustainability goals. So I want to put some context around this, this topic of accelerating digitalization and, and going beyond 1%. So explaining really what that means, and then we'll get into a discussion on how we actually do it, whether it's possible or not. So the targets that we've set, especially for 2030, for greenhouse gas reductions in this country and around the world are quite challenging. And it's looking like um, if we take a focus that's purely on the rapid deployment of uh, renewables, it's going to be really challenging to meet those targets. In Australia, for instance, they're saying that uh, for the next number of months until we get to 2030, we're going to have to roll out um, 10,000 new kilometres of transmission lines. So in six years, we roll out 10,000 kilometres, but the reality is in Australia, we typically roll out 400 kilometres a year. That's one challenge. Uh, if you break it down into renewables, we need to put in 47 megawatt wind turbines a month until 2030. That's a, a, lot, of, a lot of wind turbines. Um, when it comes to solar, we need 60 million new solar panels installed in the country by 2030. So if you just take those things into account, and then you look at, well, you've got the head of um, 
the Australian energy market operator, and he's saying that actually we need to increase our firming technologies by a factor of 30 uh, by 2050, <clears throat> just to cope with the renewables and the fluctuating energy that's going to come in. Mm. So it's a big task. So this is about what else? And if we accelerate digitalization across all industries, across industry sector, energy sector, infrastructure and buildings, then there's a couple of things that will happen. One is that those sectors become far more efficient and they reduce the burden on just relying on renewables to get to our targets mm -hmm. because they're using a lot less energy and producing a lot less emissions. <clears throat> there's one great outcome that I really like though that comes about through accelerating digitalization and that is you accelerate innovation. The cycles, the innovation cycles, the rapid prototyping and when we innovate from here, um, I guess we are able to solve problems well beyond the borders of Australia. Beyond that 1% of emissions that we're trying to solve um, by 2050 with net zero. So that's what the conversation's about today. And to have experts coming from different fields uh, here with me is fantastic. Axel, I'm going to start with a question to you. When you took over as global CEO of Siemens uh, mm -hmm. process automation business in October 2022, mm -hmm. I found a statement that you made, and I want to I want to just check where we're up to with this. You said my focus will be on how we best leverage digital transformation for our customers. At the same time, our goal must be to make the best of use of resources and bridge the gap between innovation and sustainability. How are we going now that you've been in the job for a while? How are we going with that goal? Well, it is, we are developing really fast, um, which is also important. Um, you mentioned before the Siemens Accelerator, um, a Siemens program to help our customers accelerate into digitalization. So in process automation, we take advantage of the Siemens program. Uh, on the other hand, we contribute by helping our customers to, for example, develop a digital twin of the product, of the process, of the production, combine those. Um, and what, what you were elaborating on um, faster prototyping, bringing technology faster into production, um, this is what we're trying to help our customers with. And we are on our way. Um, we are capable with our portfolio to create digital twins and helping our customers today already using new technology. So we're bridging the gap. Yeah, absolutely. Are. Good. Well, I'm hoping to hear some examples a bit later on. Vicky, um, you've got a very interesting background uh, from CSIRO, as Alicia described, and a, a strong uh, background in obviously hydrogen and green hydrogen, and CSIRO has been an innovator in that space. But now you're with Wood PLC, and you're the Director of Decarbonisation. Um, I just want to look at what Wood is setting out to achieve as well. Yes, thanks for that. And um, yeah, I have made the move uh, from CSIRO to Wood. Um, it's been really, really fantastic to be where um, a lot of the action is happening. I loved my role at CSIRO. Um, obviously, we do a lot of work to support the research, um, the innovation part of the ecosystem. But what you were just saying there, the, the pace at which we need to get things done, I really felt that uh, you know, I can help with that through Wood. And what you're saying here, those two themes of digitalization and decarbonisation, these are two very strong themes at Wood as well. We see this as underpinning everything that we do. They do go hand in hand. Um, um, if we have that information, we ha can be better informed, we can make uh, evidence-based uh, pathways forward on, on how we invest, on what we choose to do now and what we choose to do in a few years' time. We do this all more efficiently, we will get to the outcomes that we want and hopefully also exceed. But we can't do that without having that information there. That is why digitalization is so important. I, I want to actually bring you to a quote that you said. I, I was having a bit of doing a bit of research as well. And um, not long ago you said we're in a situation that we're boiling the frog. Yes. <laughs> so what do you mean by that? And uh, do you think that the frog's waking up now? Oh, so what do you mean so. by boiling the frog? So the idea of boiling the frog is that uh, you have a pot of boiling water. You put your frog in there, it's going to leap back out again. But if you have your frog in the water and your problem is slowly simmering, it's coming to a stage when, when it gets to the problem and it is at critical stage, that's the stage when it's too late 
your frog is not escaping. It's cooked. And it's cooked. It is, <laughs> literally. Okay. Now, the concern that I had, and this was through a conversation with um, a really great colleague, uh, Paul Hodgson, CEO of the uh, Scaling Green Hydrogen CRC that is uh, getting up at the moment. This is a situation that we are concerned with here in Australia, that we will get to that critical point and that by that time it's too late for us. So what can we do now? What can we do to bring forward that urgency? We don't have this burning, burning platform here so much, but we do need to have that in our minds to take action now. But what do we do to take those actions? How do we make those decisions? I think this is where we can talk about digitalization. So accelerating digitalization, which leads me to Walter. Walters, uh, you come at this from a very different angle. So we've just heard from Axel. Um, Axel Siemens is 300,000 plus people around the world and you've got your businesses in every country around the world almost. You're operating in 60 countries with Wood PLC, so also a large company. Walter, you're an SME and you represent the 90% of businesses in Australia and in the world. Um, so you're coming at this from a very different angle, but you've also done something with innovation that's already addressing something beyond 1%, beyond the borders of the country. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me and the opportunity to speak today. Um, I, I guess we are coming at a, a different angle, maybe a, a, on a more micro level, we should, we should say it uh, like that. Um, Siemens and, and Wood PLC are much larger organisations and they have the ability to change the course of maybe what governments may think and, and so forth. Um, for us, uh, we're more involved in the day-to-day -day pragmatic level of industry. So um, in particular, I guess, uh, we, we have been developing automation processes. I've been in this, in this game for 30 plus years uh, going on now. And one of our latest uh, innovations is, is in the glass industry for cleaning the molds uh, that they make glass containers from. Uh, bottles or, uh, or what you have and um, we use laser ablation for that and it's an extremely efficient way to clean them but it has a, an extraordinary amount of benefits uh, to the end user um, in the way we don't damage the molds when we clean them so uh, the resulting um, the, re the results of of that process are that they uh, don't damage the moulds, the moulds don't grow, and they don't have to put as much glass into the moulds. Uh, now, anybody who knows the glass industry understands that um, it's an extraordinary energy-hungry business mm -hmm. to be in. How many bottles are we making a year globally, roughly? <laughs> oh, uh, I can't remember the last, the last time I looked at this number uh, off the top of my head, but a typical plant is probably producing somewhere in the region of six million bottles a day. Some, so so like globally, uh, we're on track to, we're heading towards 900 billion bottles a year. We're currently about 700 billion bottles uh, yep. a year. So the, the impact of what you've done, how much raw materials is saved on average per bottle? Uh, look, it, it can be anywhere from half a gram to two grams of glass. Uh, and if you want to multiply the numbers out on that, uh, the, the, the physical energy numbers are extraordinary. And so... This is, this is what, what I say when I say we're coming at it from a micro level by, by in, engaging in a micro level like that in industry, it has large ramifications across the globe for energy usage. And, and you know, I'll, I'll just give you some, some ideas about what, what that means. Uh, if you look at the World Economic Forum's website and, and, and you look at their data, we waste as humans 68% of all the energy we harvest. That's extraordinary. So 68% of all the energy we harvest is completely wasted uh, in, in whatever form that may be. And so if we can affect a little bit of that by, by doing what we do, well, it's another percentage that we don't mm. waste. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, uh, your supply chain implications of, of eliminating the need for chemical processing or ceramic bead blasting and replacing it with laser. That really leads to a conversation about net zero because there's a big difference between carbon neutral and net zero. And I talk about this publicly a bit and I find that even though Australia and the world has made these net zero commitments, even though it's legislated, uh, even though it's probably the most significant economic commitment the world's ever made, most people don't know what it means yet. Um, 
Do you guys want to talk about the implications on supply chain and what net zero means? Why it's important when you're trying to solve climate change? Well, the, the first challenge that we experience to have, if I may start, is you have to get transparency. If, if I want to produce a carbon uh, neutral product, it's not only about what we are doing in our production process, how much energy we consume, um, we have switched already to renewable energies in most of our factories, how much waste we produce and how we reduce that and how, what we, how we deal with waste. It is where do I get my, my parts, my supplies? Um, who are my suppliers? What are they doing? Who, which suppliers do they have? What is the logistic chain? And um, working with that, we, we have developed a, a, a product, a system for ourselves that we call Seagreen, and we are, we are using that in the industry. Um, I'm very proud that um, there is a cooperation of the chemical industry called Together for Sustainability. Um, it is um, more than 47 companies are And this Sea there. Green el enables the measuring and of scope 3 emissions. Exactly, that... and Sea Green is, is just helping you to keep the transparency and not at one yeah. point of time. You can continuously monitor, but also edit. You've changed the supplier, the supplier has changed, has improved on that, on, on his deliveries for you. You immediately see that in the system, so you can keep track and you have a documentation. It is audited, it's very safe. Um, so that is something we are doing in order to meet the challenges that we have with that overall challenge. Of well, carbon. you'll be pleased to know that uh, in Australia, we've also run the first pilot of Sea Green with the food and beverage sector. Very good. And um, that's just been completed. So that was a, a first in the Southern Hemisphere, Absolutely. if not the world. It's, it's really good because you can't achieve net zero if you can't measure your scope through emissions. Right. Um, Axel, I wanted to ask you also, in 2023, the World Economic Forum recognized the Siemens Armburg factory as what they call a sustainability lighthouse. Now this was, they described as a combination of industry 4.0 level uh, technology um, combined with ecological and environmental and efficiency gains inside the factory, but also in the supply chain. So is industry 4.0 connected to our ability to achieve net zero? Absolutely. And if you don't have the transparency on, on what you're doing and how you're doing it, you don't have the transparency to, you need to optimize it. Um, you don't have the information to simulate that. And, and our factory in Hamburg is just a, a very, very exceptional example of getting that transparency and getting that data. Of course, we are um, striving also in other factories um, to achieve that level. Um, there is a great factory in Arlangen for motion control. We are doing our job in Karlsruhe uh, for our manufacturing there. Um, the factories have different requirements because they're doing different products, mm. um, but we're all striving for that. But of course, Amberg is rightfully a lighthouse. We're really proud of it. Very good. Uh, I want to jump to a topic that I, I know that Vicky uh, is very close to your background and heart, which is uh, hydrogen. So Australia seems to have an opportunity with hydrogen. And I know Axel as well, you have a glo global leadership role in, in hydrogen, which I'd like to understand more about. Um, so how important is hydrogen to Australia's future with renewables and, and achieving these targets? So hydrogen is probably most easily thought of as being one of a number of uh, low emission, zero emission solutions that we think about for re um, substituting for, replacing uh, some of the more fossil fuel based uh, ways of doing things that we have now, and not just fuels as an energy carrier. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, talk out there at the moment about hydrogen and its potential. And I know that um, Germany is one of the leading countries developing into this, you know, looking at it for the steel industry, obviously, um, and, you know, in embedding that in as part of products. And here in Australia, you know, we have an abundance of solar, we have the wind, um, we have uh, carbon capture um, resources available to us. So it also makes sense for us to think about hydrogen and there is that opportunity there. But and we have lots of land. 
huge. We have land. We do have land, but we do also need to think about uh, uh, Indigenous uh, titles as part of that. So yes, there is land, but not to think of that as being that, you know, it's just available to to utilise. And so I think um, probably coming back partly to transparency and partly to looking at your whole of system, you have solutions and hydrogen is one of them potentially, but how does it interact with those other parts of what you need to look at? And I think that is where I think digitalisation and really digitalisation at the at the heart of it is about information, about the data that you have available to you and that you're making better decisions. Whether you implement hydrogen or whether you implement something else, in, to be able to make that right choice and see how does it impact other parts of the ecosystem and um, what, what are the maybe unintended consequences of developments that we do, how do we do this in a sustainable manner, um, that is where I think this information can help us make these so decisions. So simulation, forward. digital twin, that sort of stuff. Axel, um, I know Siemens Energy, which is a separate entity uh, where we have Siemens AG has ownership of, they focus on um, electrolyzers and the, I guess, the generation of hydrogen. But you're not in that business. What have you got to do with hydrogen? Well, we are, we are dealing with automation. Um, and we are dealing with automation from helping Siemens Energy, for example, uh, in the automation of their gigafactory for the production of the electrolyzers. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we are helping with the automation, simulation and optimization during the operation of electrolyzers. Just um, keep in mind, if, if you look at the plants built today, if we plan for a new plant, you probably use different electrolyzers because the innovation curve is so steep mm. that everyone who's building a plant is using new technology, new products. So most of the plants are first of its kind. Um, we normally start with a smaller amount of stacks with a smaller capacity and then the customers want to ramp up. How do you optimize the operation? How do we help our customers to scale up fast? Um, how can we how can we lead them through the learning curve as quickly as possible or may skip the learning curve by using simulation and optimization in a completely new high fidelity way yeah. in, in order to help them to go fast and safely through operations. And then last but not least, scarce of, of trained personnel, of labor. So the, the scarcity of, of having yes, those exactly. skills. Okay. Um, um, le lack of people is just, uh, how do you train new people? Um, how do you help them to cope with different operation regimes? How do you uh, optimize the energy flow? It is mm. not only about automation. I want to spend a sentence on the colleagues from the smart infrastructure providing um, the electrical grid and the, the, the optimization and balancing. The whole balance of plant. Yes. Exactly, th that you need. So Siemens in total is very dedicated to that industry and is supporting our customers from small and medium enterprises doing the, do, doing the electrolyzers through bigger enterprises to huge EPCs and end customers um, driving those plants. Vicky, uh, Australia is amongst the top five producers of the world's um, key mineral commodities. So what are the implications of hydrogen for the resources sector? I know you've got some experience with this. Yes, so um, this is something where, uh, you know, we call them uh, hard to abate, heavy industries. Um, it is challenging. Uh, we, there often are high temperatures uh, involved in processing where you can't just simply electrify. You need to think about other ways in, in achieving those um, temperatures that you require. I mean, there are also uh, electric based, uh, DRI is, is one that you can use, but you know, you need a certain purity in, in your uh, ore, for example, before you can apply that. And so coming come back to this and, you know, I think what, this is, we're talking about how about new technologies is all very, um, really important and that's what's going to help drive us at, at the end of the day. But, um, you know, where we need to get to from here, and that can be maybe quite um, a leap from where we are now. And uh, coming back to, I think, what you were talking about wastage. You know, what can we do with existing assets? What can we do with how we're currently operating to make that more efficient? And this is probably where um, some of this is coming in with the commodities that you're talking about. There's a lot that we can do. You know, at the moment, we're using high temperatures because we are uh, melting uh, dirt 
we are turning that into a slag. Now those temperatures required for that in blast furnaces is very high, very energy intensive. And is that really necessary? If we can do some of that beneficiation processes, make that um, kind of optimize those parts of the process, reduce the energy required, and then we can bring in um, DRI, uh, which is electrify um, to help with the, the final processing. You know, these are smarter ways that we think about all the ways that we can help um, reduce our energy consumption, not just continue to think that we need to uh, have an ever increasing energy demand. So when I think of net zero, it's exactly uh, in line with this. I Almost everything I think of has either plastics or steel or glass or uh, critical minerals of some sort involved in that and that's my product eventually in a net zero world every part of the supply chain that goes into making whatever it is that i've got that i'm making that is my product carbon footprint so steel and hydrogen is a conversation that's taking place around the world uh, rapidly right now why is that important what what does that mean well, I'll start off with this, but I'm sure that you can both come into it. Um, this uh, future energy system that we're talking about, uh, when we are talking about solar panels, when we're talking about uh, wind turbines, we're talking about electrolyzers yep. and batteries, this comes into what you were saying just before about critical minerals, critical minerals. They, <clears throat> they will underpin all of that. Yep. And we need to think about beyond just the uh, equipment that we have for that. We need to think about the long-term sustainability of those products. And I think circular economy is something that we need to think about here as well. The, how recoverable it is, those middles. We need to think about this in a more sustainable way yep. that we will be requiring all these uh, critical metals. We require more steel than ever before, potentially for this infrastructure that we yep. require. But how do we make that sustainable? So how do we make the steel by using less energy? Does hydrogen play a role or can hydrogen play a role in this topic that we hear about green steel? Hydrogen will play a role. We talk, we think about it with green steel. Mm. Um, it comes in as part of the process. And currently, you know, we are using, uh, for example, the, the infrastructure for the steel industry uh, has been built for gas. And uh, we have thought about how hydrogen can potentially be introduced as blending um, for part of that. But that infrastructure may not uh, necessarily, you know, hydrogen behaves, behaves in a very different way. And what the impact of introducing hydrogen into those assets um, on that existing infrastructure is a very big problem at the moment. That was one thing that CSIRO was involved in. Um, there is the HILT CRC, the um, Heavy Industry Low uh, Emissions Transmission CRC, looking into some of these problems with billions, billions of dollars of assets and infrastructure. Um, how do we help decarbonise that process by introducing it? But what are the kind of potential effects of that? Um, so I think certainly something that uh, Germany is very much looking into. Depending on, depending on the source or on, on the type of steel you're making, um, green hydrogen comes into play. We're, we're automating the first plants with customers. Uh, there's one coming up in the United States already. Uh, we're very active. So um, we're experiencing and we will see more of that. And I also think that um, the requirement of, of, um, of green steel and the cost coming with that will drive new business models. Mm -hmm. um, the reuse of steel is very limited today. Yeah. And um, because you get different qualities, and this is why people may not source so specifically which type of steel do I use where, this will change. Mm. Okay. And, and in general, whether it is steel, whether it's plastic, uh, whether it is waste, we will go much more in the reuse or recycle of resources. Um, because it will be it will be more costly um, to have green or carbon neutral uh, okay. feedstock. So that's going to drive the first some place. changes, and, and that's going to yeah. drive new business models, and that's good. Yeah. Um, I want to pull back now to digital twins. You mentioned it uh, earlier, and Walter, you're using digital twins, aren't you? In the in the bottling, how do you use it? What what does that mean for you in in a real solution? Well, actually, we um, we just entered into uh, an agreement with uh, with Siemens, and 
uh, a couple of other organizations and we're running a pilot project at the moment mm -hmm. and it's it's actually not in the bottling part believe okay. it or not so is this one of the secret ones that we can't talk about it's, it's not so much a secret i mean the, the the company we're dealing with is a is a publicly listed uh, company on the stock exchange um they work in the mining sector and they have a, a really cool technology where they're able to detect uh, trace elements of gold mm -hmm. in core, core drilling samples. Uh, the traditional way to do that is to melt uh, the, the rock down in a fire assay process. It takes about nine hours or so to get a result. Uh, these guys can do it in 20 seconds. Mm. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and without me going into the details of that, um, one of the processes which we're developing is uh, a handling system um, to handle those samples in and out of this testing equipment, but it has to be done extremely quickly mm -hmm. in fractions of a second. And uh, we're using uh, Siemens controls and servo motors uh, to drive those. And as part of that process, we have digitally twinned the whole uh, machine. And we are looking for split seconds uh, in optimization uh, because um, their business model works on, they, they get paid per sample. So it's, it's critical uh, for them. And so we are uh, digitally twinning the machine um, and we're doing that for two reasons. One is to test uh, out what the function of the machine uh, will be like in the real world in, in virtual. Okay. Uh, but the real crux of it actually comes down to commissioning the machine. Typically when we design and build a machine, we could spend two to three months after we've built the machine commissioning it testing it, optimizing, optimizing it. it, and so forth. So what we want to do now is when the mechanical design is finished in, in CAD, uh, we want to hand that digital twin over to the electrical controls engineers and say, okay, now you have a real virtual model, run your code, test your code while we're building the machine. And when we've finished physically building the machine on the floor, theoretically, we should be able to drop the program into the uh, controller and run it. Mm. Now. I think, honestly, we'll get about 95, 96% of the way there. There'll be some finessing to do at the end, but it's, it's pretty close. And um, honestly, the technology has come along in leaps and bounds from what so, I saw five or six years yeah. ago. So Axel, yeah. it's, it's, really, yeah. it's really cool technology. Axel, Absolutely. in fact, Siemens is known to have the most comprehensive uh, digital twin technology for a physics-based digital twin. Um, but recently we've been dabbling into something more than physics based into the industrial metaverse and making it really high fidelity. Can you tell us what that's about and why, why is that interesting? Well, you probably read about that, about the cooperation that we have with NVIDIA to, yep. to really um, come to a real, um, it, it really looks real. So it doesn't look like a representation no, of a facility it, or a it, product. It, it it is real, and and if you want to, you know, if you if you want to go beyond the first simulation and get started, if you really want what you said to get 95, 96 percent done and optimized in a virtual world, mm. this is when you need the high fidelity and the the high level of optimization, and then. Uh, another topic which is underestimated, which is not only the looks, it is more about why does it look so realistic. Um, it is the synchronization of the different sources that you have on a, on a, on a timely synchronization. So if you simulate in, in, a, in the real world, in a virtual world, in order to optimize uh, and check and practice and, and, and train, um, you have to synchronize the different sources you're getting from the engineering systems, from the motion that you have in the engineering, um, and, and in all of the other sources that you have. And this synchronization is done in, in that metaverse, in that metaverse version that we're doing together. So uh, another thing uh, I actually read about was a simulation or a digital twin of a robot arm. And uh, through this digital twin, we were able to re remove 65% of the weight um, 82 percent of the components um, it was 80 percent shorter time to put it together um, and it it's designed using a skeletal structure that can only be 3d printed now the implications globally for that are, are really impressive so designing in decarbonization i want to talk about that what are your thoughts on designing in decarbonization from the beginning this is a different way to design a different thinking 100%, yeah, it's, um, 
the technology is called generative uh, AI, and um, there's lots of different names, different packages have different uh, acronyms for it, but uh, effectively we are entering into an age now where, uh, where traditionally the method is that an engineer would design a part, uh, they would uh, try to optimize it as best as possible, but you know, it's, it's most machine parts are fairly blocky. Um, now we have functionality in CAD packages where we can actually put it through a generative AI process. We can do an FEA analysis and the FEA analysis will tell us where the stresses are in that particular part. And then we put it through this process and using that stress analysis, it will remove systematically pieces of the part that are not needed. And it's, it's quite organic. When you look at the part, it's, it's quite an organic piece that comes out. And so then you can go through the process of, of removing those parts, but you can go one step further than that because then you have to machine this part in a CNC machine. And so when you remove the parts, you want to make sure that the angles and, and corners that you're putting into the part are not too tight because if they are, you might have to do multiple processes to machine that part. That also consumes a lot of energy. So what you should do is optimize the part so you use one machining process to remove the, the material. And so, you know, this is uh, coming back to my statement before about looking at the micro detail. And it really is important to understand that while the macro can be driven by government and large organizations, the micro has to be driven by individuals and individual organizations. It's super important, but it's a, it's a great technology. And I think it's only in its infancy we will see that uh, accelerate I, I would imagine quite rapidly over the next five to ten years, it's it's going to be really big. Yeah. And and to spin that a little bit further, if you think about three D printing, if you think about the digitalization and the digital twin we have today, we kind of cut off the whole logistic process because we send a file over the world and print it somewhere else, and we don't have to ship parts from one part of the world to another part of the world, which is also reducing the CO2 footprint mm. but on the logistic field. But is 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 the three D printing heading down that path that it's good enough to do that? It, like it used to be. Oh, it's 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 already there. So mm -hmm. okay. we have three D printers at our operation where we three D print powdered nylon uh, parts they are as strong as machined nylon parts. And, and we use them. We use in, currently, we have a, a machine which we're building in our factory, and the tooling on that is made from these 3D printed nylon uh, parts, and we are 3D, 3D manufacturing, uh, 3D printing and manufacturing. And, and yes. by the way, this is going to reduce the steel we are using. Yes, <laughs> yes, you only use the materials that you require. Yep. Um, we had this at CSIRO as well. And the um, ability to, so for example, I'm thinking about a catalyst scaffolding that was done with 3D printing, and the, you use less catalyst, but it is a more efficient uh, chemical process as a consequence because of the utilization of AI combined with machine learning, combined with 3D printing. Uh, but you know, you have machine printing as well in, in other areas, you know, for um, bones, for replacements um, in the body. It's um, yeah, definitely has come a very, very long way. So we need the brightest minds uh, to be doing this. This is mm -hmm. not a limitation of technology anymore. This comes down to what we can come up with in our own minds. Is that, so designing that decarbonisation requires a different way of thinking. How, how do we get there? Well, I think, uh, you know, and, and we're talking about more advanced technologies or you know, newer technologies today, but you also have to go back and look in each individual manufacturing organization, let's say, and, and I'm more swayed towards manufacturing because that's what, we're, that's what yeah. we're in. You could go through every factory on the planet and look at all of the motors that run in those factories, and I would guarantee you they're two to three times larger than, than what are actually required. Mm. And people are running those motors all day long and using an enormous amount of energy that they don't need to be using. So you could start there. You could start optimizing motors in, in factories. You could look at conveyor systems that run constantly all day long with not much product coming down it. So why not put some controls and sensing in place to stop the conveyor when you don't need it and then start it when a product does come along. And I am sure that if you went through all the factories in the world, you would see an enormous amount of inefficiency. So, that, so there's a lot to be, to be done in the industrial sector. Um, I, I guess you guys can comment on well, that. Well, certainly things. something. Oh, oh sorry, go. I, I actually, I was watching something earlier today uh, where Axel was speaking online, and it was about 
a PCS Neo controller. So it's not just about our technology helping others to reduce their footprint, but we've actually redesigned it for lower footprint. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So what's that look like? Well, as I said, using different components, uh, we choose chipsets that have a significant lower energy consumption. Uh, We try to reduce substance of concern. We are trying to use a CO2 carbon footprint neutral material um, for the housing. All those things we either have already implemented, the chipset we've implemented already, this was who you were referring to, um, and now we take the next steps in, in the redesign. So redesigned. how much reduction have we made in the footprint of that? More than 50%. Wow. More than 50%. Mm. And we have the um, most carbon neutral controller and the one with the lowest carbon footprint and the energy consumption in the market. Okay. That's amazing. Can I come back to yeah, something? Yeah. I mean, we have been talking a lot about technology, which may, you know, again, I think we, we've touched on this utilizing existing assets better. Um, you know, a major part of what we can do to, to drive this change is how we currently operate and the, um, you know, again, linking digitalization with decarbonization and the designing, as you say, with existing factories, with existing operations, how can you get mm. more out of those assets already? And, um, you know, there's embedded carbon, there's embedded energy in that. If we can get more out of that, um, you know, we talk about electrification, we talk about hydrogen, we talk about carbon capture, but really these are capital intensive, um, many uh, companies, businesses will consider them to be risky investments and the business cases you need to make for them and the, the cash flow that require. You can get 10, 20, 30 percent from low hanging fruit, from Absolutely. more from your existing assets. That frees up cash flow. It gives you political capital with your stakeholders yep. to then invest in some of these more, you know, bigger bets of electrification, hydrogen, CCS, and so forth, and and drive that final 70%, 80% from those technologies and, and, you know, partnering with technology partners to to trial some of these more emerging um, ideas. You know, they're, they're all great ideas, but in reality, in implementing to get those business cases up, you know, you don't want to have this situation where you've got to stop and go, well, you know, this is too much for us, it's too much change. Deal with what you have now. There are easy ways to do it. And digitalization, transparency of information, this is how we can help you uh, make those decisions that you can do ne- do today to make those changes. And bringing back to circular economy came up earlier, and that sort of leads to that topic. In Australia, 20 million tonnes of waste go into landfill every year. Um, I think globally, the number for recycling is about 13%. It's not much. But Axel, you have a zero waste policy already in the factories you're responsible for? We're, we're not 100% there. We're 100% at the renewable energy. At the waste, we're not 100% there yet, but we are striving towards that by 2030. So by 2030, yeah. you will have zero waste. That's our goal. That's, that's incredible. Um, I want to sort of bring this to a close because we're talking to engineers here. What sort of and, and you've all got STEM skills. The biggest topics in the world today are going to be solved by people with STEM skills. A lot of people in senior, in authority, in government, do not have uh, STEM skills. And I want to sort of understand what drove you into these topics yourself. Um, I think, uh, Vicky, you're a, a physicist. You have a PhD I'm in training. physics. I'm training. Oh, I'm a practicing one. <laughs> So we, we have a global CEO with a PhD in physics as well, Dr. Roland Bush. So it's, uh, why? I just say why. Why did you go down that path? Why physics? Well, I, I think from a young age, it was um, wanting to understand uh, why things are the way they are. You know, the, the laws that govern us, um, how, how everything uh, works around us in the world. That was my passion. Um, and I think uh, from that, is that curiosity? It's that wanting to understand and then kind of the the later application of this, well, how can I use that to help solve problems? And now I don't do that myself. I'm not as smart as many of the um, people that I work with, Um, but it is No, you only have a PhD in physics. But they are the people (laughs) actually coming up with the solutions. You know, I I promote them and and tell their stories, really. Um, So that's probably where my passion comes from and to really uh, try to 
put that to something, is that curiosity, how can we be better? Mm. How can we mm. do better than what we are now? Um, that's probably where I'm coming from there. Walter, what, why did you go down this path? Wow, that's a, that's a long story, um, so I'll make it quite short. Yeah. Um, I, I've always had an interest in how things work, M much the same. Um, much to, to the disgust of my uncle when I was a small boy, he was a fireman and he had a Motorola pager and I pulled it apart. It was a very expensive <laughs> pager back in the day. I think it was worth thousands and thousands of, of euros. And I pulled it apart. Of course, I couldn't put it back together again and he was quite upset with me, but I did learn what was inside a pager. And, um, and, and so that sort of uh, stoked my, um, my, my senses into you know, how the world worked and, and I've always been like that. And I've worked in many, many different industries from the textile industry through the food industry and so forth. Um, probably these days though, what really drives me is seeing some of the younger people coming through in the industry uh, and being able to, um, I guess, hand over some of the knowledge that I have. Hopefully they'll take it and, uh, and run with it uh, you know, with the next generation. Certainly today, though, it, it seems to me that it's the most exciting period. And, you know, our, our forefathers probably thought this back in the 40s or 30s, but I would say the acceleration of technology and where we're heading to at the moment is astonishing. And in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see some amazing things. So, yeah. Axel, how did you land here? And uh, I, I know Siemens talks about a, one of our strategic priorities is growth mindset, which is really about this continuous learning angle, uh, problem solving, lateral thinking to solve problems. How did you end up in the place you're at with STEM and the skills that well, you've got? Well, like, um, like Vicky and, and he said, it is a curiosity about solving problems, helping customers and um, an opportunity to help customer also is an opportunity to solve something and make something work. And I really wanted to sing, see things, how they work. Um, and I enjoyed working with people all my life. And, and being in a company like Siemens is just very fortunate because you are allowed to do different things along your career. Um, you may change significantly into significant different roles staying with the same company. And I've, I've enjoyed that. And, um, and that, again, doing different things, learning, you know, building a network of people with different experience and backgrounds is about growth mindset mm. because it is staying open yeah. mm -hmm. and then connecting mm -hmm. the dots for the better solution or for the better outcome for our customers and partners. So that, that problem solving and thinking of way, different ways to do things, I want to share an example and just get some, see how that resonates with you. I've got two examples I want to share from Australia that I would consider to be beyond 1% examples. One is, um, in South Australia in particular, they have a certain type of seaweed, and CSIRO had a role in discovering this as well, that when you um, feed this to cattle, um, it reduces the methane that comes from cattle, which is mainly mm. through the regurgitation yeah. and the burping. Mm -hmm. It can reduce the methane by 90%. Now, the context of this is that we think about the things that are right in front of our faces, usually the sexy things, a car, and we think electrification of cars, and let's go that way. And I started to look into this and I found that cars represent six or seven percent of the world's emissions. So the path we go on to electrify cars is a slow one. We'll get there. We're going to reduce emissions eventually. But what else? And then I look at cows and I say, OK, hang on. How much emissions come from cows? Mm. The meat that we eat, um, that's something like 12 percent. And a car and a cow are virtually equivalent. One cow, one car in terms of their emissions. If we can solve this through what we already have in technology today and reduce the cattle emissions by 90% without affecting anything else, that has a bigger impact on the world than cars. There's one example from Australia, which is beyond 1%. The second one is the fire season's always on somewhere mm. in the world, and it's a big topic in Australia. Um, at Hanover Fair this year, we had one of our, one of, uh, our colleagues oh, yeah. Uh, come and present on the Siemens stand and uh, he with Siemens has developed the world's first automated fire loading system for fire retardant onto airplanes yep. and this is a big deal mm. and it saves 50% of the time to load a plane to fight these fires. Now that's a no-brainer when you think about what happens when trees burn down and they produce oxygen, they store carbon etc. 
There's more than that though. Just the, the savings while the plane's being refuelled mm -hmm. um, in one airbase in New South Wales amounts to 35,000 litres of jet fuel saved a day, which That's is nine right. tonnes of CO2 per day every day of the year in one airbase. So there's two examples of beyond 1%. I want to get your response to that and I want a closing comment about, um, I guess, advice that you'd give on engineers and their role in going in helping the country go beyond 1%. Who's going to start? We, up to you. Oh, maybe we'll go this Ladies way. First. Ladies first. Ladies first. Come All on. right, okay. <laughs> um, I guess for me, the theme that I get from that is the um, inadvertent benefits that have come from it. Things that you didn't even realise that also deliver positive impacts elsewhere. And that for me is pretty much about um, this problem that we have, this journey. It is multi-dimensional. It requires so many different skills, so many different ways of looking at the problem um, that, you know, it's something that uh, I've often heard about and I will say again, no one organisation can do this. No one skill can do this. We all need to come together and think about it because um, there are greater benefits. But at the same time, if we don't come together and get those different viewpoints and insights at the point of designing the solution, there could also be inadvertent negative impacts from yeah. what we do. Uh, I mean, I think you've talked about this in the, the cane toad. Um, we don't want to create a cane toad. No, we don't Australia. want to create a cane toad. Yeah. So um, for me, thinking about for engineers in general, the multidisciplinary nature of that is keeping your mind open to your peers, to the people that you have these conversations with and come at it from that and we can de deliver better solutions for all. Walter? Very good. Um, I mean, I, I think I'd like to take it back a little bit to um, Vicky's background in physics. Uh, I mean, they're both wonderful stories and I'm sure there's hundreds of other stories like yeah. that around, around the globe. If you're a young engineer and you're, you're, you're thinking or you're thinking about getting into engineering and, uh, and you're thinking about your field, you'll go through the traditional training at university and you might do a bachelor's or a master's or even a PhD like, like Vicky. That's just the start of it uh, and, and it's by no means the end. And so what I would say to you is to question everything mm. and, and don't, be, don't be locked in because your lecturer at university told you something was one way or the other. That's not what science is about. So science is about questioning everything, thinking about it fundamentally, go back to fundamentals, always fundamentals. The equations and the maths you can look up at any point in time in a book or a Google or chat GTP, but always go back to fundamentals and think fundamentally. Well, Axel? To, to build on that, a start in the first place. We need the engineers, no matter if we talk about artificial intelligence, chat GPT, yeah. large language models, whatsoever. We will need the engineers to think about a problem and coming up with a solution. The second topic is speed over proportionally matters. And in order to groom and foster the hope that you were describing, Vicky, what we have to do now is repeatable solutions mm. for recurrent problems in the world. The firefighters were a good example. Now we have to roll it out. Um, and, so and the good news is uh, after, after presenting on the platform in Hanover, uh, he's now been asked to support the EU with this same product, and it is going to be rolled out from Australia to other parts of the world. So what I really like about my job, I'd, I'd like to, to work with the young people um, to support developing together in a network. No one can do it alone. No, we have to build partnerships. We have to build networks. We have to build platforms where people can exchange, where we come together from with different experience and different capabilities and then find those solutions and scale them. Um, and this is what is, what is great fun for me to work with and live with. And I think this is why there are good reasons to have hope. Excellent. I think that's a, that's a great note to finish on. I'd like to thank all the panellists. Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to thank all of the uh, engineers from across Australia and potentially around the world who dialed into this session today. Thank you, and um, we'll see you next time.